I grew up on Weaver Street in Greenwich in my grandfather's house, and he was the one who originally immigrated here, was right around the corner on Mosier Street. And I remember going over there a lot, and they had uh, the typical things an Italian family would have. They had the grape vines and the fig trees, and they had chickens, and they had a, a uh, large garden. And one of my uncles made grapes, grape wine every year, and he had a a dirt cellar out in the back where he kept those things. Oh, it was very interesting. I remember all of that. They would uh, grow not just tomato and squash. They would have prosciutto hanging from their basement. They would have homemade wine. They would have, you know, homemade, you know, olive oil, uh, bread. I mean, they would jar, you know, I, I would walk into the basement and there would be uh, 25, 30, jars of tomato that they from from last season my grandfather he was a very quiet man uh, he was terrific with a uh, weapon I don't call it a weapon but a gun and he was able to shoot squirrels and rabbits and eat them and he would come over the Mianus River and, uh, and grab the eels and eat the eels. Uh, we would never touch them. I mean, uh, my grandmother would make them, you know, uh, a rabbit was good, but squirrel and eel were not for us. My great-grandmother, she died in 1937 when I was eight years old. She was considered, in the neighborhood of North Mianus, the midwife. She had a male goat that she would take around to the neighbors and have the male goat serve the neighbor's female goat. Now in those days, there wasn't money that exchanged hands. It was all the barter system. She provided the goat, they would give a bushel of tomatoes or something like that. One of the women whose goat, female goat was being served said to my great grandmother, how do I know that your goat is good? And my great grandmother said to her in Italian, it sounds much better in Italian, I don't know how to say in Italian, your husband should be so good. Uh, the chicken coop, just about everyone in the neighborhood had chickens. We picked those nice fresh eggs every day, listened to the, the roosters crowing in the morning. I know how my grandparents and my great grandparents survived because they had chickens and rabbits and pigs and they were able to um, subsist on that. I remember I used to have to take care of chickens and go and pick out all the eggs and uh, I would actually, I hate to say it now, but I had actually, you know, you would also eat the chickens and I would, uh, I would kill them. Something I couldn't do today. <laughs> But back then, I was young, and I guess I didn't know any better, and you know, you would chop their heads off, <laughs> and uh, then clean them, pluck them, take all the feathers off, and clean them out, and then you would have a, your Sunday dinner. And we used to raise hogs. My grandfather would take three pigs, piglets, and he would raise them to 250, 300 some odd pounds, whatever it would be. And chickens and, and, and goats. My brother, uh, actually, he was raised on goat milk. And, and I still remember to this day the, the slaughter. Maybe it was a yearly slaughter, but I can still see it. I vividly remember all of it. And just before the, before the cold weather came in, he would slaughter them. That one guy would come around and do it for everybody. He would make his own sausage, his own hands, and his own pig's feet. They used to make, you know, the sausage and every piece of that pig was used. There was no, no waste on a pig. Maybe you wouldn't need a whole pig, so you would go halves with, you know, your neighbor and then would feed your family and his and you would be able to do, there was that kind of um, reciprocity going on. He had, he had a professional help him cut, it, cut up the meat. He didn't do it himself. And, uh, but he used to hang the sausage in the attic to dry out. My youngest uncle, Arthur, was six years older than I am. So we grew up more like brothers. We played together, we fought together, we did everything that brothers do. And we used to go into the woods and pick nuts, hickory nuts and 
and whatever kind of nuts that were available, and we take them up to my grandfather's attic and spread them out to dry out so my mother and my aunt would have nuts for the holiday. Uh, like I said, my grandfather would hang all these, the, the, the sausage, but he always kept some down low. And my uncle and I thought how, how foolish he was because when it was ready to eat, we would knock off a piece and eat it. And my grandfather would come up from the attic and he would put his hands on his hands and he would say in the target, hey, watch out, the big rats up here. I said, no, 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 said, no they don't eat our nuts. Well, they no stupid. They can go they eat in the woods, they eat the nuts. They come over here, they eat the sausage. It took us years to find out he was smarter than we were because he knew damn well we would break our necks to try to give them those. So he put four or five pounds on those so my uncle and I could. And, and those are the things that I remember. When I grew up, there, were, uh, there was an abundance of grocery stores. There were stores in the neighborhood back there. You know, a lot of people did not have cars. They didn't drive, and there weren't a lot of buses. And there were usually little neighborhood stores that you could go in and you could get some food and, and different things. But uh, we never wanted for things. We always had enough to eat. Uh, I used to be able to eat my way through the neighborhood on my bike if I got hungry. I could just pull into a, a grocery store and get food and they would just put it on the family's tab and my mother would pay at some point in time. I never worried about paying. I think we all took food for granted. Uh, it was assumed it was all fresh, it was all handmade, it was all homemade. My grandmother was an amazing cook, to amazing. I mean, they would talk about dinner every day and plan for dinner around 9 a.m. in the morning. I would say our favorite meal was homemade raviolis that my mother used to make. My grandmother enjoyed it. She enjoyed when people ate, like ate and ate and ate. Like to a point, I mean, food, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy. As a kid, I used to go crazy for ravioli. That was great because they were all homemade. They weren't all nice, neat little things the way you buy them in the store. You know, take a piece of dough and it would fold and it wouldn't quite mesh, that kind of thing, but they were good. And she made her own bread. She never went to work. She had to take care of eight children. We get a lot of food from the Greeks, the Arabs, like when we, lamb, the lamb that we eat with the gold lamp, the, the head of the lamp. That comes from the Arabs, from the Greeks, that's so, so it's still in our tradition. The hot peppers. Calabria's like the little Mexico village. We use a lot of spice, spicy peppers. The, the Cabello's next door who had a pizzeria. They opened a pizzeria in the 60s. And literally, it was, I know you see lots of signs around now, homemade, handmade pizza, but the Cabello's literally made, they made their sauce from tomatoes that they grew in the yard. They they made their own dough. They, the, it, it truly was homemade, handmade pizza. And I say they were there. They must have done that for about 20 years. When I was really little, I used to kind of get made fun of, like when I was in elementary school, because I kind of had a little different lunches, for example, from the other kids. Because the other kids, it was just peanut butter and jelly sandwich. I was telling my parents, I was like, no, we have to follow everyone else. And my mom was like, why are you so afraid to stand out? And then I was telling her, I just wanted to fit in. My favorite sandwich is like martadella. And um, that's like one of my favorite like sandwich lunches. I want to make a macaroni, make a gnocca, make a uh, noodle, make everything. Yeah, I still make. Which is your favorite? Favor make this. More taste, and my son more like. My son, my daughter, everybody like this macaron. First, first thing I have to make the dough. And I gotta make a rest a little bit. And I gotta make a, like a, like a this, make a like that. And I gotta make a, take it out the, the dough that we, of here. But when you eat, very good this macaron. Yeah. <laughs> All of my aunts were expert 
at certain things. One was great at eggplant parmesan. Another one was good at ravioli. So, I mean, I grew up really, really lucky because we ate great Italian food. I think that was part of the experience of, of being here in the St. Rocks area. And I just thought everybody ate that good. It wasn't until I left and, uh, you know, uh, joined the Navy, I just, I thought everybody ate great Italian food like that all the time. Um, as a kid growing up on Valley Road, um, there were, uh, let's see, about eight houses that were all touching, properties touching, and I don't really remember there being any grass. There were, there were all gardens. The Italian men took pride in their gardens. When an Italian moves into a place, a new home, and there's not much flowers or gardens, it's their responsibility that they feel that they need to make this place beautiful. Everyone had a little something different in each garden. And I, I never understood that until I finally figured out that they all had something different because they all shared. And I, I remember how special it was and how hard it was. A lot of work, my grandfather and my father, uh, towing the soil, um, nu nutrition to each and every plant, uh, which was the staple of the Italian diet for most of the year. If this one was growing corn or that one was growing peas, and everybody got a little piece of everyone's uh, harvest, other than tomatoes and peppers. They all grew tomatoes and peppers and lettuce. The tomatoes were the primary important. The way our backyard was, we had a, a big garden, and that was right next to the Zitzi family, and they had a garden, and we were on the other side were the Chipettas, and they had a garden, and then behind were the Gregories, and then the Figliolas, and then the Brancas. Okay, so we were all, we, they all had their gardens, and they all had little fences. Had a big garden. And my grandfather would be out there, they would be out, everybody would be in their garden in the morning, they'd water and... Big, big garden. And I could hear, you know, my grandfather would talk. They would talk to each other. We never had to worry about food. We didn't have a lot of things. Uh, <laughs> they would talk to each other. They'd be in, how are you? What's going on? This kind of thing. Um, and I remember those days so clearly. During the Second World War, we had rationing, actually. So it, it, everybody had to be very careful. And we grew a lot of our own food then. Everybody had what we called, we called them victory gardens then. And so we grew a lot of the food. My grandfather used to have a garden that was absolutely perfect. And he had uh, wooden planks that were probably six inches wide in between all the rows of tomato plants. And the dog understood that he walked on the planks parallel in the garden. He never walked through a plant. It was, it was amazing. My grandfather just loved gardening. Uh, it was one of his pride and joys. The area that he lived was once a quarry. Um, and they had actually taken stones for the Brooklyn Bridge in the backyard. Um, so there was a tiered, uh, well, kind of a mountain, and he created by hand a tiered garden area. And there was three levels to it, and on the upper level he had a, he had a place with a table to sit and an, an old-fashioned ice box that he still had his sodas in there, and he used to have the kids come up and, you know, they would get a soda and they'd look at the garden and see all the waterfalls and fountains and you know displays and things that he had and trinkets and all the flowers and uh, it was really something for the community to come see and that's where a lot of people when they used to come to pick up their shoes got stuck <laughs> because they also had a clothesline that went up there that my grandmother would send up some peaches and wine or uh, whatever it may be if there was food on the stove then that would go up as well and they would sit and enjoy the afternoon My father had a big garden, and my mother canned just about everything. We canned enough tomato and tomato paste to last from year to year. She canned uh, tomatoes, made sauce, canned carrots, peas, beets. We would sit there on the back porch, and we'd all cut and peel, and Mom would cook and bottle. So 
uh, we had enough to last for the year. My fondest recollection was the canning, the annual canning of the tomatoes, which took place the beginning of September. Um, my grandmother from Chickahominy, my grandmother Carmela Straza, who remained a widow all of her life, would come over to our house in Coscob, and she and my grandfather, Trippetta, who remained a widower all of his life, would do all the work with the rest of the family, my mother, my father, my aunt, joining in. And then we did pepper and onions and tomatoes, which were great for sandwiches, etc. And we made, we survived. We were survivors. And it was, it was a, a big job because you had to pick the tomatoes, then you had to put them in um, hot boiling water to clean them, and that softened the skin so you can easily peel them. And then that all was done outside under our porch. And as a family gathering with um, a lot of laughter, telling stories, um, I got hollered at a lot because I was always doing something wrong. And then they would chop up the tomatoes and put them in this huge pot on the wood-burning stove in the kitchen and, and cook it down. And I can still smell the tomatoes cooking because it filled the air. And after that, while that was cooking, they would prepare the glass canning jars and they make sure they were sterilized. And after the tomatoes were cooked down, they would pour the uh, tomato sauce into the jars, fill to the rim, and then they were left to cool. And then the, the uh, top to, to, uh, to seal them off was a very important step because you wanted to make sure that no bacteria, no harmful bacteria got inside the, the jars. And they did uh, hot peppers, pickled peppers. I learned how to can. I now can tomatoes. I can uh, swash peppers, hot peppers, um, uh, green tomatoes. I can everything. I mean, I can everything, even olives. So this process took an entire day, but it was a lot of fun. I mean, it's a lot of work. It's, a, it's very, you know, we'd be in there all day and it'd be cool in the garage. We'd clear it all out and we would do everything in there. And once everything was done, the jars were cooled off, they were sealed, they went down into the root cellar. And that's where they remained for the for the upcoming year. Make a sauce um, like a 200, 300 jar of the tomato. Yeah, yeah. We used to go in there and get them. I loved them. We were young, and we still loved the hot peppers. My brother and I went in. Yeah. So I would go into the basements, into the dirt floors, and there'd be two, three hundred jars of tomatoes. There'd be figs. There'd be mulberries. There'd be uh, apples, there'd be pears, uh, green tomatoes, and that's not counting the uh, crocks of uh, homemade prosciutto that was soaking in uh, uh, lard with the, with the suprasats and the dried sausage. The jars would be taken out at least twice a week to make the Italian sauce for the macaroni, which we called it then, for Thursday and Sunday was traditional macaroni day in the Rose Italian kitchen. If your tomatoes got, had worms in them or whatever, they didn't, you know, weren't good, then someone else would share with you so that you would be able to do your canning. I can remember as a boy uh, going down in our basement and uh, my father used to have these big crocks and he used to uh, take everything that was left over in the garden that didn't ripen and then pickle it. The green tomatoes, cauliflower, carrots, and put all in its crock with vinegar and uh, and uh, water, you know, 50-50 mix, and it would just float there and then put a wooden top on it, on the crock, and then put a big rock on it to hold everything down under the water. And then um, certain times when you got hungry, you wanted a little snack, you'd sneak down in the basement, take the top off and take it, it was just like having pickled uh, uh, stuff out of the, uh, like you have today, pickles. So we used to eat right out of the crock. There used to be mold forming on the top of your, Pushed the mold on the side, it didn't, didn't hurt anybody, and uh, we used to eat. We had a plum tree, our neighbor had a, had, a pea, uh, had a pear tree, so, you know, we had plums, he had pears, so you could, you know, share, that kind of thing. And the other neighbor, Mr. Zitzi, he had peaches, so we would go and pinch his, he had good peaches, so we would go and pinch peaches sometimes from him, I mean, not a lot, but. I came in America on July 22nd, 1972. I was 12. I still do my 
I had my tomatoes in the jars. I marinate eggplants, peppers, stuff, peppers with prosciutto and provolone. I make my wine. I make prosciutto, capicola, soppressata. I, I have fig trees, I make my garden. So I try to keep the, I hope my kids, they're gonna keep on, keep the tradition like I did, like I, I'm doing. I would like to tell you a story about my father's um, twig that he brought over uh, from Italy. Most people from Italy came here, in the southern part particularly, all having fig trees, olive trees, and fruit trees, and vegetables, and so on. He brought over a twig from Italy in his shirt pocket of the figs, you know, the fig tree. So he started a, a, tr a tree, and uh, after he started it, he gave it to my brother. My father came from Italy when he was 16 years old, by himself, on a boat, and lived uh, in Chickahominy, and my dad had a fig tree. And my brother planted it. That tree is huge now. And there's, um, it was in the newspaper. My brother passed away like many years ago, and uh, his son took it over to take care of it. We had the same thing. The only thing is with the fig trees, we either had to bury them in the ground for the winter, or we had to tie them up and insulate them. In the winter time, about November, December, they would tie the tree up after all the leaves have come off, tie the tree together, cover it with either burlap bags or tar paper, put it, dig a hole wide enough and long enough for the tree to be laid in, tip the tree down, cover it with leaves, grass, whatever they had, dirt, and then wait for spring, April or May to dig it up. Put it, stand it up, open up the branches, and let it grow. And this was a process that went on for many, many, many years till my father get to, got to be in his late 70s and the tree got too big for all of us to dig up. And uh, that was the way we had figs all summer long and they were beautiful. I don't want to say everyone had fig trees, but I would say the majority of people had, a, had fig trees. My grandfather used to, um, many people used to keep their fig trees in wooden barrels and they would move them into the garage or move them into the basement. My grandfather didn't do that. His fig trees were very large. He would cover them with burlap, fold them over and cover them with burlap and somehow that insulated them through the winter and um, we had figs every year. We had figs every year. During the fall, all the, all the men in the community would get ready for making the wine. And that started by them going to a siding in Porchester. And that's where most of the fellows went to get their boxes of grape from the, um, the, the wine trains that came in bringing the grapes from California. Well, my father, uh, he started making wine down in our basement which was underneath the garage, which was a beautiful wine cellar because it was cool. It was underground and always kept a constant temperature. And he was a, um, a fanatic for doing the thing correctly. A lot of the fellows would just get a barrel, start mixing the wine and, and make it and hope that it would come out. But he would clean his barrels. He would make sure everything was as perfect as he could so that the wine wouldn't spoil. At that time, you could smell the neighborhoods where wine was being made by the grapes that be, were being crushed. My grandfather made tubs in the big caskets, uh, in casks. Um, he made dandelion wine and red wine, but not white wine, just dandelion wine and red wine. You could go on Bruce Park Avenue, Davis Avenue, Lee Grand Avenue, and Chickahominy and smell the grapes being, being fermented in the, in the 50 gallon drums. So the grapes that we didn't make wine with. Um, they would uh, uh, make uh, grape jelly or peach jelly and get the wax and melt the wax over the top of the, the jar to seal it in. There were no twist tops on those, on those jars. Uh, as time progressed, this goes around the, ninth, the late 60s and 70s, 
the tradition started to fade away. Many of the tr Italian traditions were going by the wayside. And uh, my father at that time was about 65. And I saw the wine press and uh, <clears throat> all the wine equipment rotting and, and getting rusted in, in the backyard. <clears throat> and I said to myself, this would be a great opportunity to bond with my father if I could fix all the wine equipment and have him teach me the traditions again and uh, maybe I could carry that on with my family. So uh, about 1970, I fixed all the wine uh, equipment. I enjoy, I'm a carpenter, so I enjoy doing that type of work. I fixed the oaken baskets that we crush them in. I got everything ready and I proceeded to make my first batch of wine <coughs> under, my, under the tutelage of my father. Well, by, by golly, the wine came out great. So now I started to get my young sons involved. And of course, dad, we don't want to have anything to do with it. So as much as I tried, I couldn't get him to make, make the wine with me. They were about six or seven at the time. I kept making the wine every year, using different varieties of grapes and having fairly good results. Um, the true test of my wine is that my wife would, would like it. If she enjoyed the wine, I knew it was good wine. It wasn't heavy Italian wine. It was a good, palatable wine. The boys were now about 17, and I wasn't going to make wine one year. They came to me and said, Dad, aren't we making wine this year? And so I said, ah, the tradition has caught. So they started to help me make the wine, and uh, uh, we've used different varietals, and I, I've really zeroed in on the Cabernet Sauvignon. It's a good grape. It's good for the homemade, homemade winemaker because it, it's not fickle, and you can make a good, a good batch without uh, spoiling it. And uh, I think as most of the people that I've uh, given bottles of wine to, uh, they've come back and asked for more, so I'm happy with the, the process that I've incorporated. Again, I don't use any sulfites, so the wine is pure. If you drink it, you're going to get drunk, but the next morning you're going to go to be able to get up and function without any hangover. Because, it, as, as you know, store wines are full of sulfites and full of preservatives.